Hello, everyone. We are going to, uh, we're going to begin our conversation with a legend in photojournalism, Mr. Ron Haviv. Bearing witness to war and injustice, Ron Haviv, photojournalist, there's a very good possibility that most of you in this room have seen his work as cover pictures on magazines or images and stories about conflicts you know, of the past three decades, Panama, the Balkans, Haiti, Darfur, Rwanda, Iraq. Afghanistan, Libya, the Arab Spring, Congo. He has brought some of the thousands of images he has recorded. But before we focus on those images, let's begin at the beginning. How did you become a photographer? Well, I actually just kind of fell into it. I was uh, studying at NYU, I was studying to be a journalist. And NYU is incredibly expensive, as many of you might know. And so I had multiple jobs to help pay for my tuition, and I randomly got a job working for uh, a fashion photographer and started to get exposed uh, on the very small end, working with his agent, uh, a little bit about the business of photography. And around the same time, my uncle gave me a camera as a gift, and another friend of mine in NYU was a serious hobby photographer. And I started getting hit from photography from all sorts of sides. And at some point, which I still to this day cannot remember why or when, I decided that I'd rather tell stories with photographs rather than with words and said, OK, I'm going to be a photojournalist. Let's talk about your very first foreign assignment, Panama. How did that happen? Well, it's a kind of a funny little story. I was uh, covering the uh, gay pride parade one day in New York, and I, I saw this photographer walking around. And he looked like he had walked off of a set of a movie about, a movie about photographers, good-looking guy. Uh, long blonde hair, the requisite photojournalism scarf, uh, <laughs> press credentials. And I went up and I started talking to him. And I, and, and I was just really enamored with this guy. And I said, so where are you going next? He said, oh, I'm going to Panama. I said, wow, it's amazing. I'm also going to Panama. I didn't know where Panama was. I didn't know what happened in <laughs> Panama. But I figured, this guy is going to Panama. That's the place to go. Now, this is so long ago, I couldn't take out my iPhone and figure out what was happening in Panama because there were no iPhones and there was no internet. So I had to quickly do research, and it was a very basic story. Dictator of a very important country, Panama Canal, Americans have a huge base there, was going to hold elections to prove to the world that he was loved by his people. And that was the story. So, but who sent you to Panama? Who was paying for that trip? Well, I got an assignment. I was freelancing for the New York Post. They gave me an assignment. They loved Noriega, the general. They called him Pineapple Face because he did all these crazy things with bad skin. And they said, OK, you have your first foreign assignment. A week before I'm about to go, uh, they changed managing editors. All assignments, all travel was canceled, and I had nothing. I ran into Chris Morris, the photographer that I met earlier, and told him the story. And he said, you know, I usually travel with my wife. She's not coming with me on the story. The airline has a buy one, get one free special, like a free ticket. And you can have this ticket. And I'm on, he said, I'm on assignment for Time Magazine. So the room is paid for, the car is paid for. You're welcome to travel with me. So it was like a workshop slash job, and off, off I went. Now you talk about a lucky break. Is that a lucky break or what? <laughs> Unbelievable. So generous. He's one of the most generous photographers around. And there's a back story, now, well, not a front story, really. When you went on this first foreign assignment, your pictures were noticed by the President of the United States. They were. This is the main image. So you saw the Newsweek cover, and then Time did their own version. And this is a photograph that took place. Noriega lost the election. He nullified the election. And the would-be victors came out onto the streets to start an uprising. And I wound up being uh, the only photographer shooting color that day and was able to take this photograph of the vice president-elect. He's the one covered in blood. He had been, his bodyguard had been killed trying to protect him, lying on top of him. And he was stabbed, he was stabbed in the arm. And this was my you know, first exposure to, to violence. And uh, what, what was kind of amusing, in, in a very odd way, in, in these very difficult situations, there's always sort of odd things that happen. And so while the vice president was sort of stumbling around and I was photographing him, I heard somebody say, con permiso, excuse me in Spanish. And it was this paramilitary guy who was asking to step around me so he could beat up the vice president. Oh my goodness. Were you thinking that maybe your life is in danger? 
At, the, at that particular moment, I didn't really understand what incoming uh, fire sounded like. I only realized later when I heard it another time, I was like, oh, now I remember this sound. So no, this was complete baptism by fire and, and very, very fortunate. How did you know what to do in terms of composition, color, uh, angles? How, how did you know where to, where to stand, what to shoot? How, how, did, how did it come to you? Well, that's hopefully where my skills as a photographer comes in. And these are things that I think of very consciously, using these photographic aesthetics in order to, uh, to capture a photograph, to have, to have real meaning. Before we, before we leave Panama, tell me about the president's comment about your image. Well, when this photograph came out, I had all the covers of the magazines. I was about 22 years old, and it really this was... This your first cover on, on a First cover, yeah. uh, first real story. And I was kind of like, this photojournalism thing is really not that hard. You, you go somewhere, you take pictures, you get covers of magazines. And it was all like nobody had ever heard of me before, and it was all really about me, about my career, and what I can do, and so on. But six months later, when the United States invaded <coughs> Panama, and President Bush spoke to the nation as um, the U.S. as the troops were coming in. I, I was with the troops, so I didn't see the, the speech until later. But when I heard it, everything kind of switched. That it wasn't about me, it wasn't about covers, it wasn't about awards. It was about the stories that we tell. It was about the people in the photographs. And it was about playing this role in providing information and communication so you can make better decisions on who you vote for, what you think about the world. And it was like kind of understanding the role, and my role as a photographer, in an entirely different way. What did the president say about your, your picture? He said, uh, to paraphrase, we all remember these horrible pictures of uh, Vice President-elect uh, Guillermo Ford being beaten up by a so-called Dignity Battalion, which was the name of the uh, paramilitary group. And then he went on to explain uh, you know, the reasons why the US was uh, invaded. Fantastic. So now, to the Balkans. Next image there. By now, you have done that war in Panama. I've been to, uh, I was in Kuwait when Kuwait was liberated. I was already, had been taken prisoner. I was in Iraq, I was a prisoner in Iraq for a while. Uh, I saw Nelson Mandela come out of prison, photographed. Uh, so now, the by Berlin now, you're wall. an experienced war photographer. Yeah, I yeah. have done some stuff. And you're dealing with some of the most infamous, who turned out to be later war criminals of modern times. Yes. How did you befriend them and gain their trust to allow you to go with them as they were doing their, their business, their cleansing. Well, this is a photograph of a man named Arkan, who's, who was a leader of a Serbian paramilitary group called the Tigers. And he fought, uh, and his group fought in all the different wars in, in the dissolution of Yugoslavia. And this photograph um, was basically myself and a colleague, Alexandra Bula, who uh, she and I had later founded an agency together. Um, we went up to him and we said, could we take a photograph? And he was very, um, very egotistical, uh, very smart, psychopath, responsible for killing thousands of people, uh, but loved the camera and loved the press and thought that we loved him. And basically, he organized this whole photograph, put his men up on, on tanks. And as we were just about to take the photograph, somebody handed him a live tiger that they had liberated from a zoo uh, in an earlier battle. Next image, please. Where's this? Uh, this is in Vukovar. Vukovar was a town, uh, a Croatian town, that had been under siege for three months. It was the longest siege at that point since Stalingrad. Uh, Croatians surrounded by Serbs. And I spent a lot of time on the Croatian side as they were defending themselves until it was no longer possible to get back into the town. And then I went in with the Serbian troops as the, as the town fell to Serbia. And so this is a Serbian paramilitary couple celebrating their victory. How long were you on the ground in the Balkans? Well, it took about get, it was get, about 10 years for the whole thing to, to take place. So probably more than five years I was on the ground. There were times, and the next image I think will demonstrate this, when you were told, don't take the picture, um, or you got a strong suggestion that they didn't want you to. Tell us about this man. Well, this man, uh, his name is Harush Zaviri. He's an Albanian. Uh, who happened really to be in the wrong place uh, at the wrong time. And he was living in a town called Bielina, working there. And Bielina was where the first civilians of the Bosnian War uh, were killed. And he's here being taken, taken prisoner. And then in this image here, you see some of the first people uh, to be killed. And th these are Archon's troops, the Tigers. So now, you, you were there be before they were killed? Yes. You saw them being murdered? I did. 
So this, the, the Bosnian War was the third war to, uh, in this series of wars in Yugoslavia. And by that point, everybody knew from step to step, from Slovenia, the first place to Croatia, the second, that the third war was going to happen unless there was real intervention from the West. And so I went there as, as tensions were rising. And while I, were there, while I was there, this, I got a call that in this town, Bielina had been split between uh, Bosnian Serbs and Bosnian Muslims. And the civilians were fighting against each other. By the third or fourth day, Arkan arrived with his troops and said he was there to liberate the town from Muslim fundamentalists. And I asked him if I could go with his troops. And he knew you from before. And he liked the photograph so much of the tiger that he let me go with his troops. And I was able to then uh, go with them and witness them uh, as they were you know, committing these, these war crimes. And so there's a photograph that's not here is of, um, this turns out that it's, it's the butcher, his wife, and the sister-in-law. And at one point, I, had, I was able to photograph the wife trying to save uh, the husband the whole time they were, trying to, they were telling me, no photographs, no photographs. So that's, the wife is in the white? Yes. And her husband is? Is right behind her. Is right behind her. Yeah. And who was the other person? The sister-in-law. The sister-in-law. Yeah. So the husband was killed first. And while he's lying there bleeding, the wife comes out and pleads and tries to, to save him. attend to him. Yes. And, and then they shoot her. And they shoot her. Right. And the sister-in-law? Was brought out later, and then they shot her. So a couple of ethical questions here. Is there ever a time when you think that maybe it's too much to show the carnage? I think it depends how, how you show it. I think it's important that in situations where I'm unable to stop something from happening, and unfortunately there have been many times like that, then it's the least that I can do to try to make sure that there's a document, that there's evidence of what, of what occurred. In the town of Vukovar, um, the picture you saw with a couple kissing, of probably an hour before I took that photograph, I witnessed two other executions where it happened right in front of me. They didn't care that I was there. And then I tried to document it. I had a gun put to my head and told, if I take a photograph, they'll kill me. And I made a promise to myself that if I was ever in this unfortunate situation again, that if I couldn't stop it from happening, I would have to make sure that there was at least photographic evidence of what had occurred. But didn't they tell you not to take these pictures? They did. The whole time when they were shooting them and what was happening, they were screaming at me, no photographs, no photographs. Well, well, and, 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 but you're still taking photographs when they're telling you not to take photographs and they're killing these people. I am, because it was really you know, something had, there had to be something that came out of it. But did it not occur to you that they could turn the weapon on you? It, it did occur to me. I was, uh, I was very nervous. And in, in this particular picture, which is the only photograph that I have of them with their victims, um, I was literally shaking as I took that picture. But I needed to make sure that there would be irrefutable proof that they were, that they were responsible for this. This image was later used. Tell us about that. This image, along with some other work of mine, was used in the International War Crimes Tribunal in The Hague. Uh, to indict Archon and also in the Milosevic trial, as well as now we're waiting for a verdict against Radovan Karadzic, who is the political leader of the Bosnian Serbs. So it was also used against him in his trial, and hopefully there'll be an answer uh, about his results soon. At the time you took this image, were you thinking that it might be useful at some point in a prosecution? Or what, no. What, no. Even at, at this point, the, the, uh, there was no war crimes tribunal. The idea of journalists contributing to war crimes tribunal was not even a conversation, and it's a controversial conversation as it is. Um, but this was just simply to, for me, the war hadn't really started, and I wanted these photographs to be published, and I wanted there to be a reaction. And the photographs were published in Time Magazine and other magazines around the world. George Bush was still president. I thought to myself, he reacted three years earlier to my work in Panama, for sure there'll be some sort of reaction here. There were already troops on the ground, uh, there to enforce the, uh, the peace agreement for the other wars. There was no reaction. A week later, the war kicked off, and now here we are celebrating uh, this week the signing of the 20th uh, anniversary of the Dayton Peace Accords. And it was Clinton who eventually launched the military action. Uh, it was. Yeah, yeah. Um, talk to me about your impulse, as I heard, I guess it was Anderson Cooper who said there's an impulse not to look, but a duty to take the picture and not to flinch. How do you balance that? 
Well, I, I, I really feel that I'm respons I have a responsibility to be there for you, that I'm your eyes to places where you're unable to go. So it's not up to me to say like, oh, I don't want to see that, or that's not proper. It's like I, I want to do in a way that is dignified and, and possible, but a way that you can relate to the photographs, but also for you to get the information, for you to understand what's going on. And if, if I'm not there to do that, there's no real reason for me to be there. You've also talked about being the last person to see someone before they die, as was the case with this image, and people who are on the verge of death. This yeah. was a prison of war camp, I assume. This was, yeah. This was um, one of the camps that we found early on. And again, very little reaction from the world when these photographs came out. Next image. This is towards the end of the Bosnian War. This is Sanad Madanovic. Uh, he was a soldier fighting to retake his village four years later. And he brought me to his home. They had just taken the village. This is his house. In his front yard is a grave of 69 people, including his family. He's the only survivor. And as we were leaving, he collapsed against the tree. This is uh, from one of the survivors from Srebrenica. Srebrenica, which is the, the, the act of genocide that was declared with Bosnia, and was also the impetus to launch uh, the airstrikes. Um, this woman um, has just come. Her, her father, her brother, her son have all been killed. Uh, and I was fortunate enough to meet her 20 years later, uh, several months ago in Sarajevo, and to find out what's happened to her life. And basically, she spent the last 20 years still mourning and trying to find the remains of, of all our family. These are also the widows of, of the victims of Srebrenica. I like this photograph in terms of because there's so many layers and you're seeing just all of these different people and only, the only men are either very young or very old, so there's obviously something missing. It's all the men that were killed. And the grief is just, it's just palpable. And it just sort of said, I, I walked up to them and I asked them what happened and they all just, just started crying. When you are in a situation where people are on the verge of being shot or, or, or killed, what do you see, or do you see a duty to, tr to take the picture or to try to s save their lives? It's really a case-by-case -case situation. And, and in times when I have the ability to, to save someone, if I'm the only person there, without question, I'm a human being first and a photographer second. If there's other people there to help, I'm going to photograph the situation. And if I feel like there's really nothing that I can do, I would lose my life, then I, at this point, I, you know, I choose my life. And, I, and I'm, there's, there's very little that I can do. And I've seen uh, on one of your websites that you did save um, a man. Was that in, in Haiti? Off? In Haiti. Yeah. yeah. There have been times when I've been able to intervene. I've, I've bandaged people up. I've taken people to hospitals. Uh, taking people to feeding centers and, and stop people from being beaten or arrested, as many of my colleagues have as well. And even as recently with Greece, taking refugees out of boats and helping them and not photographing. Next image. Uh, this is from Afghanistan. This is my project. Uh, I spent uh, three months with the Northern Alliance in 2001. After 9-11, I went there and basically was there for the liberation of Kabul, living, living in Afghanistan in, in the north. This is during the day that Kabul fell. Mm -hmm. um, these are two young Taliban um, soldiers. These are Northern Alliance um, fighters. And in one of these very odd situations, um, they came, they saw me on the road, the Northern Alliance fighters. They said, come, we want to show you something. They brought me in into this vehicle. And they said, OK, we're going to kill these guys. And I had a little dictionary, and my diary is not very good. And I basically was able to convince them that I was a CIA officer and that they needed to, to not kill them and to bring them uh, to their commander, uh, which, which they did. So you saved the lives of these two Taliban guys? As, as, far, as, as far as I know. A at least at that point you yeah. did, yes. Uh, this is um, a Northern Alliance commander. This is fighting outside of Kabul. This is going to your point about being with somebody you know, at, the, at those last moments. So this commander was very happy that I was there to document them as they were trying to liberate this area against the Taliban. Uh, we were in a very bad military position. Uh, we made a mistake, and we wound up in open ground with the Taliban on a mountain, and myself and uh, Tyler Hicks from the New York Times, and these uh, Afghan soldiers were stuck in this basically crater that had been created by uh, one of the B-52 bombs. And we were just waiting for, our, for the Taliban to launch a shell into the hole. And then all of a sudden, he was shot. 
And, the one uh, on the right or the one on the left? The one with the blood uh, coming down his... Oh, uh, my goodness, I didn't realize yeah. that... So oh. he's, he's actually dying there at that, at that moment. You've talked about life expectancy of... Well, you've talked about the fact that most war photographers don't go past their mid-30s. You are a few years beyond that now. Just, just a touch. Just a little bit, yeah. So what is it about 20s and 30s that sort of lends itself to what you do? And what is it that keeps you going beyond the usual shelf life? Well, I mean, I think all of us, you know, you have, when you're young, you have this sense of, you know, you're not vulnerable and, and you're going to live forever. And as time goes on and things happen, you start to see that changing. And you have life responsibilities that come into play and, and you make debates about what's worth it and what's not. Um, as do I. Uh, I. I am a little bit more selective on, on what I do, but there are certain events that I think are very important. Uh, and I still think that my, my view and my eye is, is worthwhile. Uh, let's go to another image. This is Iraq, actually. So I was embedded uh, with the Marines, embedded with the scouts, who were the unit that were supposed to draw contact uh, to find out uh, where the enemy was. So we were the first ones uh, to, cross, uh, to cross into Iraq. And um, you know, very brave, but very young, very young Marines. Um, and it was you know, a very interesting experience to be embedded fully kind of part of their unit. I was with them for three months. So this is before U.S. forces took the airport? This, this is like within the first couple of hours of... of uh, oh my. Of, Next image, please. Ah, the famous image. Notice, if you will, the American flag on the top of Saddam's head. Now, how many of you in this room, we've all seen the statue fall. How many of you have seen the statue with the flag on the head? I just recall seeing the statue but no flag. So tell me about the flag. Well, I mean, this was, you know, there's a lot of different stories about, about this. Peter Moss wrote, wrote a great piece about sort of there's a huge backstory about why this happened and uh, why it was, became so well known. And basically it was because, um, you know, this is where the hotels were that were housing all the journalists that were going live. Palestine Hotel. The, and the Sheraton. The Baghdad Sheraton, yeah. Right. And so the Marines arrived there, and I was actually standing next to the commander when one of the Iraqis who were trying to knock down the statue with small hammers walked over to him and said, could you please help us uh, take down the statue? And the commander said, okay, you know, fine, I'll, I'll help you. And then they set this up. And then one of the Marines went up uh, and put that flag over. And within moments, the, the commander got a phone call uh, I assume from Washington screaming, take that flag down. So there was a live image of, of that. This was going live. I mean, you probably saw it on television. Uh, and uh, this, you know, so that there's a, there was a number of journalists there because many of the journalists that had been embedded on the Iraqi side were all based, were all based right there. And so they were told to take the flag off because? Because we went from the idea, the Americans went from the idea of being liberators immediately to being occupiers. And didn't want that flag to represent occupation. Where are we here? This is now, we're now in Egypt. This is uh, the fall of, uh, fall of Mubarak. And this is, again, one of these very odd situations. So Tahrir Square filled with anti-Mubarak people in the center, pro-Mubarak people on, on the outskirts. But this, this man kind of waded into the crowd and started screaming pro-Mubarak uh, slogans. And within seconds, they just grabbed him and dragged him off. And a mob just descended on him. How did you get in the middle of that mob to take this image? Well, this is right before the mob. They were about to drag him away. So I photographed him here as he realized that he made a very stupid mistake. And he was dragged off into the mob. And I had befriended an Egyptian-American guy who was six foot seven and like 250 pounds, a very nice guy. And I grabbed him and I said, you have to go and get that guy and get him out of the crowd. So he waded in and literally picked the guy up by the scruff of the neck and dragged him off and handed him over, over to the army before he was beaten too badly. This is also from, from uh, Egypt. This is a, uh, there were obviously many people wounded and there, are people, there were makeshift hospitals and so on around, around Tahrir Square. And this is from the fall of Tripoli. So I was with uh, the Libyan rebel forces as they were fighting their last, last remnants of the Gaddafi, Gaddafi forces. This is the refugee crisis, right. what I call Exodus 2015. What, what, uh, what body of water is this? This is the Aegean. This is uh, Lesbos. I was there um, documenting these guys coming across, uh, mostly Syrian, but 
uh, Iraqi as well, and, and some Iranians and Afghans uh, coming across. And next image. This is a mother and child. They're, they were giving donated clothes, so they're trying it on. And here they are sleeping in the streets before beginning the next part of their journey. Hold that image, please. You've talked about why you shoot color, not black and white. Tell us, of, and, and also how you try to compose your images to have artistry in them to draw people to, to look at the tragedy. Yes, as I said earlier, I think the, the photographic aesthetics are incredibly important. That I really want you, more than the content initially, to have a relationship with the photograph because of the visuals. If you're connected to the visual because of color, because of light, because of composition, when you actually understand the content, it's that much harder to look away. So I want you to have that relationship. So I'm very conscious. I mean, I'm also criticized for making horrible things too beautiful, war porn or things like that. But for me, I disagree. I think that it's, it's the only way to do it, especially today where we're inundated with so many images. It's only going to be by the skill of the photographer that's going to sort of grab your attention. Thank you all so much. It's been an honor and a pleasure, sir, to meet you and to listen to your wisdom and your experiences. Thank you very much. Thank you. For more on this program and other Carnegie Ethics Studio productions, visit carnegiecouncil.org. There you can find video highlights, transcripts, audio recordings, and other multimedia resources on global ethics. This program is made possible by the Carnegie Ethics Studio and viewers like you.